this Sunday. Are you ready to meet the press? We celebrate 75 years of Meet the Press. I hope no one will vote for me, either for me or because of my religion. Where every occupant of the Oval Office has appeared since the Kennedy administration. The Watergate matter should have been handled properly. Where former presidents and future presidents have made news. So you want to be president? I do. Men marrying men, women marrying women, and heterosexual men and women marrying women are entitled to the same exact rights. In four years, you're going to be interviewing me, and you're going to say, what a great job you've done, President Trump. Where the next day's headlines appear first. I would not support the sending of an American team to the Olympics. Where leaders from around the world answer tough questions. Democracy is my idea. A weak Israel can be thrown into the sea. Where civil rights leaders have shared their struggles. We must move, but we must move with wisdom. I'm still convinced that there is nothing more powerful to dramatize a social evil than the tramp tramp of marching feet. I understand that. I've broken the ice. I was not bitter then. I'm not bitter now. And where everyone is held accountable. You know what I say? I got an egg on my face. <laughs> Welcome to Sunday. It's not easy to meet the press and a special 75th anniversary edition of Meet the Press. From NBC News in Washington, the longest running show in television history, this is a special edition of Meet the Press with Chuck Todd. Good Sunday morning, Merry Christmas and Happy Hanukkah. So at 8 p.m. on November 6, 1947, moderator Martha Roundtree debuted a press conference of the air right here on NBC. 1947 was the year Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in Major League Baseball with the Brooklyn Dodgers. It was the same year Chuck Yeager became the first person to fly faster than the speed of sound. For 75 years, through 12 moderators and more than 3,500 broadcasts, the program that President John F. Kennedy once called the 51st State has made news and held newsmakers accountable, interviewing American presidents, world leaders, political candidates, civil rights icons, scientists, sports figures, and entertainers. This morning, we're going to look back on the 75-year uh, history of the longest-running show on television, and we're going to look forward as well as our democracy is challenged and our mission of clarity and accountability is more important than ever. Here's Marvin Kalb. For democracy is a very precious national asset that is most healthy, most admirable when there is an open and vigorous exchange between the press on the one side and the politician and policymaker on the other. That's what this program has been all about. Thirteen presidents have answered questions on Meet the Press, Herbert Hoover, and then every president since Kennedy. Senator John McCain was our most frequent guest with 73 appearances. Senators Bob Dole, President Joe Biden, Newt Gingrich, and Chuck Schumer round out the top five. Dr. Martin Luther King appeared here five times during the 60s for the final time in August 1967, less than eight months before he would be assassinated. I refuse to uh, give up. I refuse to despair in this moment. I refuse to allow myself uh, to fall into the dark chambers of pessimism because I think in any social revolution, the one thing that keeps it going is hope. The broadcast has covered national debates over the last seven decades, from the Cold War and the rise of communism to fights for equality and progress to debates on taking the country to war, be it Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, and now Ukraine. There is no reason and no excuse and no justification for the loss of one more American life there or for the loss of more Vietnamese. This war can be ended, and it should be ended now. Cameras can be the best disinfectant, and the program has also never shied away from controversy, interviewing Louis Farrakhan, David Duke, Joseph McCarthy, and Fidel Castro, among others. The only way to keep a democracy thriving is to expose ourselves to the uncomfortable as well as the comfortable. Alternative facts, a phrase coined by former President Trump senior advisor Kellyanne Conway in the early days of the Trump administration, became a touchpoint in an era when facts suddenly came under attack. You're saying it's a falsehood, and they're giving Sean Spicer, our press secretary, gave alternative facts to that. But the point remains... Wait a minute. Alternative facts? Alternative facts are not facts. They're falsehoods. Another president, Richard Nixon, reflected back on his mistakes in office right here in 1988. One of eight presidents 
who have appeared during or after their years in the Oval Office. In the autumn of your years, as you are reflective about your own life's experiences, personal and as a politician, what criticism do you have with your own behavior or style or things that you've done? As president. As president or as a human being? Well, we don't have much time to cover the, the human <laughs> being. Let's start with the president. Uh, first, naturally, the Watergate matter should have been handled properly. Uh, I should have concentrated on it. And apart from the fact that it was wrong, it was stupid. And generally, I, I'm called many things, but uh, not often am I called stupid. The country has gone through, in the last uh, year, year and a half, some very difficult times. Uh, we went through the problems of Watergate. We have uh, been suffering from a very serious economic uh, recession, although we're coming out of it very steadily. Uh, we've had uh, a traumatic experience uh, in Southeast Asia. All of these and perhaps some other problems uh, raise some doubts in the American people as to whether their government, uh, their form of government, was uh, capable of meeting these kind of challenges. This doubt, I think, has been considerably reversed. And I think that's extremely encouraging. Uh, they know that, uh, that honesty and candor has been restored in government. Mr. President, assuming the Soviets do not pull out of Afghanistan anytime soon, do you favor the U.S. participating in the Moscow Olympics? And if not, what are the alternatives? No, neither I nor the American people would support the sending of an American team to uh, Moscow with Soviet invasion troops in Afghanistan. I've sent a message today to the United States Olympic Committee spelling out my own position that unless the Soviets withdraw their troops within a month from Afghanistan, that the Olympic Games be moved from Moscow to an alternate site or multiple sites or postponed or canceled. Do you think we do a good job? Have we been fair to you? On balance, yes. I think, um, first of all, I don't think there's ever been a president of either party in any philosophy that didn't think that uh, he should have gotten a better press. So that just goes with the territory. I think there have been rather dramatic changes in press coverage over the last uh, 20 years, uh, particularly in the, ca in the Washington press, which which bears some examination and evaluation by those of you who are in the press. But I don't think that the president gets anywhere by making any comments on the press. Do you believe if you had gone to the Congress and said he should be removed because he's a threat to his people, but I'm not sure he has weapons of mass destruction, Congress would authorize war? I went to Congress with the same intelligence, Congress saw the same intelligence I had. Uh, and they looked at exactly what I looked at. And they made an informed judgment based upon the information that I had. The same information, by the way, that my predecessor had. And, and, and all of us, you know, made this judgment that Saddam Hussein uh, needed to be removed. In light of not finding the weapons of mass destruction, do you believe the war in Iraq is a war of choice or a war of necessity? Uh, I think it's a, that's an interesting question. Please uh, uh, elaborate on that a little bit. A war of choice or a war of necessity? I mean, it's a war of necessity. We, 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 my judgment, we had no choice when we look at the intelligence I looked at that says the man was a threat. President Bush, what did you learn in your government's response to the tsunami, to the disaster response to Katrina? What lessons did you learn that this administration should bear in mind? Uh, first of all, it takes time to get the supplies in place. But that, that, that shouldn't deter them. In other words, there, there's an expectation uh, amongst people that things are going to happen quickly. And, and sometimes it's hard to make things happen. Why does it take a disaster of this scale and magnitude away from the United States to create this kind of bipartisanship? Well, I think that when something like this happens inside the United States, we act in the same way. I, I think that it reminds us of our common humanity. It reminds us of needs that go beyond fleeting disagreements that um, whatever our policy disputes are don't seem to matter much when people are dying. You got to go to Syria yeah. in some form or another. You've ruled out boots on the ground. Uh, 
And I'm curious, have you only ruled them out simply for domestic political reasons, or is there another reason you've ruled out American boots on the ground? Because your own, your own guys have said you can't defeat ISIS with airstrikes alone. Well, they're absolutely right about that. But you also cannot, over the long term or even the medium term, deal with this problem by having the United States serially occupy various countries all around the Middle East. We don't have the resources. It puts enormous strains on our military. And at some point, we leave, and then uh, things blow up again. Well, that's so what happened with Iraq. So, so we've got to have a more sustainable strategy, which means the boots on the ground have to be Iraqi. What about the boots in Syria? On the, and in Syria, the boots on the ground have to be Syrian. Hey, you were always hard on Obama. You thought he wasn't enough of a cheerleader. He was not a cheerleader. Um, if you could have one do-over as president, what would it be? Well, it would be personnel. Uh, I would it? say if I had one do-over, it would be I would not have appointed Jeff Sessions to be attorney general. Seventy-nine foreign heads of state have appeared on the broadcast, 65 while in office. From British Prime Minister Harold Wilson, who joined in 1965 for the first live transcontinental satellite interview, to Indira Gandhi, who appeared on Meet the Press seven times before her assassination in 1984. In April 1959, Fidel Castro appeared on Meet the Press for his first visit to the United States since the Cuban Revolution. And he declared that he was not a communist. I want to know where your heart lies in the struggle between communism and democracy. Democracy is my idea, freedom. But many people used to call democracy seeing things that are not democracy. I am not communism. I am not agree with communism. I'm deeply committed uh, to democracy, not merely because it's a good ideal, but because for a country of India's vast size and great diversity, I think democracy, that is a people's participation, is the only way to make it function. It has always been our policy that communist China should be in the United Nations, and if the issue comes to the United Nations, we shall support the entry of communist China to the United Nations. I'll say what, quite plainly why. We have never in our country, and this goes for governments of all political colors, said that you only have those people in the United Nations or that you only recognize them diplomatically if you like them. Heaven knows I don't expect miracles if she comes into the United Nations, but you know there's been a lot of evidence through the refusal to bring China into the United Nations that it has driven China more into the arms of Russia than would have been the case. I'm convinced that a, the communist idea is no more than a uh, beautiful but perhaps uh, quite harmful uh, fairy tale for people. It is um, beautiful, attractive, uh, and uh, if millions of people are, you know, uh, taken in by uh, this ideology, so you certainly cannot ignore it. But for us, um, for the country, uh, which for uh, 70 years lived under the standards of this ideology, it is clear that not even ideologically, but uh, economically, we have reached uh, an impasse. And it is clear that uh, a state cannot exist uh, on that basis. What do you need right now to thwart this strategy of essentially getting to the winter and creating a stalemate? I always say to win this war, we need three main things weaponry, finances, and sanctions. Mm -hmm. Weaponry, let us protect ourselves and to go into ahead to make these counteroffensives, very successful counteroffensives with support of our partners. We also ask our partners to recognize Russia as a terrorist country because all what they are doing in Ukraine, so it's just genocide. This is like terrorist acts. Where is Mohammed Omar, the Taliban leader? We don't know. He's hiding. Now, how, how can someone that's hiding be called a force? He's hiding. We're looking for him. Where is Osama bin Laden? He's hiding, too. And we're looking for him, too. Are they hiding in plain sight? Uh, they're hiding, perhaps, in the mountains. They're hiding, perhaps, in, 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 in the border territories between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Maybe they're hiding somewhere else. We don't know. We're looking for them on a daily basis. And no fugitive can run forever. Many Americans consider the PLO primarily a terrorist organization. Is that not justified, at least to an extent? George Washington was, uh, had been uh, named one upon a time by uh, the British or the British uh, Empire emperor. He is a terrorist. 
the Vietnamese, recently, uh, you used to, uh, to, call them to call them terrorists too. The Algerians? Uh, the Algerians. But uh, all the freedom fighters used to have this name before their independence. There's an impression in this country that peace in the Middle East is further away than it has been at almost any time in the long history of this conflict. Do you see any progress at all towards peace? That uh, there's less hope for peace now than there ever was before, I do not agree to. Because uh, I maintain that a strong Israel is not only the best guarantee for peace, but is the best incentive for peace because there's no sense of making peace with a weak Israel. A weak Israel can be thrown into the sea. The real problem in the Middle East uh, is not the democracy of Israel that has shown restraint and responsibility, uh, but it's the countries like Iran that pursue nuclear weapons with the explicit goal, first of annihilating us, but also ultimately of conquering the Middle East and threatening you. That's why they're developing ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, that are meant for one purpose only, to carry nuclear payloads to a theater near you. They're not intended for us. They already have missiles that reach us. They're developing ICBMs to reach the United States. Don't give them these weapons. This deal did not demand any other behavior changes in Iran outside of their nuclear weapons program. Why not include all that? Well, this deal was about the nuclear issue, and I think the right way to conclude the deal was to make it about the nuclear issue. But, you know, we shouldn't be naive or starry-eyed in any way about the regime that we're dealing with, and I'm certainly not. I spoke to President Rouhani uh, yesterday and said that we want to see a change in the approach that Iran takes to issues like Syria and Yemen and to terrorism in the region, and uh, we want the change in behavior that should follow from that uh, change. So we're not not starry-eyed at all, but and I'm, I'd reassure our Gulf allies about that, but actually taking the nuclear weapon issue off the table, that is a su success uh, for um, the America and Britain and our allies, and we should be clear about that. Why do you think the British monarchy is so strong, despite the fact that so many monarchies in Europe have died? I think the British are more liberal in their outlook, and uh, I think uh, instead of most of the monarchies in Europe were really destroyed by their greatest and most ardent supporters. Uh, it, it was the most reactionary people who somehow or other tried to hold on to something without letting it develop into change. Have you ever thought to yourself, maybe it might be nice to be king, or have you thought, I'm glad I'm not king? Oh, I, yes, I'm glad I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> when we come back, a look at why announcing a run for higher office has played such an important role on this broadcast. So you will not run for president or vice president in 2008? I will not. It's fair to say you're thinking about running for president in 2008. It's fair, yes. Welcome back. Hundreds of hopefuls for higher office have appeared on the program over the years to dodge and duck and sometimes eventually answer the question. Will you or won't you run for president of the United States? The Meet the Press candidate interview has been a staple from Adelaide Stevenson, who said, I do not seek, I will not seek the Democratic nomination for the presidency. And it was the Democratic nominee two months later after saying that. To Shirley Chisholm, who spoke about her groundbreaking 1972 bid right on this program. To the more than three dozen active presidential candidates that I've interviewed as moderator of this broadcast. And it has launched candidacies. Long before he ran for office, Ralph Nader's appearance in 1966 generated so much mail for this broadcast that the post office finally called Meet the Press and offered to deliver Nader's mail directly to him. In 1960, just a month after his speech to the Greater Houston Ministerial Association, our first Catholic president, John F. Kennedy, appeared here to answer questions about whether in the United States there should be a religious test for office. I hope no one would vote for me, either for me or because of my religion. Now, I've said that consistently, and I, I mean it, because it's, it's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's an important election. There are very serious issues which divide us, and I don't think this is one of them. My religion, or Mr. Nixon's religion, or... After all, I thought that matter was all settled in the Constitution when it said, provided for separation of church and state, when it provided that there should be no religious test for office. So I would hope we could move on. There'll be a large and vocal minority uh, who will be very critical of you, who are very critical of you now, uh, 
how, how do you go about reconciling these if you are president of the United States? The problem will not be easy because we are confronted with a generation gap. We're confronted also with a racial gap. I believe I'm a pretty good listener. My objective is to bring about a change of national policy, both with reference to the war and also with reference to national priorities. By talking as I will about what I think can be done positively as far as the future is concerned, what can be done in the 1970s, what this country needs to stand for, and the idealism and the feeling of unselfishness which I think exists in our country. But it seems to me that I can uh, make a contribution, and that's what I intend to do. At the age of 49, feeling as I do about this war, I could not conscientiously support it. I'm not recommending that course uh, for anyone else, but I regard this war as the most barbaric and inhumane act that our country has ever committed. First of all, gentlemen, you have to really recognize that I'm doing something this country has never really been done before. It's a question of inculcation, reorientation, and education. Never before in this country, ever since the inception of the Republic, have you had a woman seriously running for the presidency? I suppose every man uh, uh, has many moments in which he says, if uh, I had the uh, position and the, uh, uh, the authority to do certain things, uh, this is what I would do. Does that mean that you would like to be president? Uh, that means that you're asking me about a decision that uh, if you have me on the show, say, about a year from now, maybe we'll be closer to getting an answer. I'll be there when the last vote's counted. And uh, I, expect to, I expect to win. Well, considering the size of the deficits, it seems to me you were right in 1980 in calling candidate Reagan's policies voodoo economics. Oh. How do you feel about using oh, that I phrase? I hope you wouldn't mention that. You'll be 73 okay. when you become president. Right. 77 at your, after your first term. Right. Would you consider making a pledge to the American people you'll serve just one term? No. If you look at your <coughs> voting record, your opponents say you look more like Ted Kennedy than Sam Nunn. Aren't you a liberal? No, I'm not, and those labels don't mean what they once did. So you want to be president? I do. I have not made the final decision. I'm giving it serious consideration. I'm not determined to enter the race, but I have determined to set the pace, to set the priorities. And I can say to you, because of our numbers, our loyalty, and our public policy issues, there should be a black on that ticket. One of the things about a President Bush is I'll be surrounded by good, strong, capable, smart people who understand the mission of the United States is to lead the world to peace. We ran the best grassroots campaign that I've seen in my lifetime. They ran a better one. Why? Because we sent 14,000 people into Ohio from elsewhere. They had 14,000 people from Ohio talking to their neighbors. That's how you run, win in rural uh, states and, 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 and uh, rural America. Tim, I don't want to run for president of the United States. I will not run? I do not intend to run for, no, I will not run for President of the United States. How's that? I don't know how many Period. ways to say no in Period. this town. It's fair to say you're thinking about running for president in 2008. Uh, it's fair, yes. Dissent is the mother of assent. And in that context, I have decided to run for president. Does Sarah Palin and I disagree on a specific issue? Yeah, because we're both mavericks. But we share the same goal of cleaning up Washington. The question is whether are you the, the moderate from Massachusetts who championed universal health care, who at one time was for abortion rights, or are you the, the candidate who said he was a severe conservative? What will you be as president? I'm as conservative as the Constitution. I want to uh, <clears throat> read something that, that was paraphrased to you. It says, it is essential, Sanders said, to have someone in the 2016 presidential campaign who is willing to take on Wall Street, address the collapse of the middle class, tackle the spread of poverty, and fiercely oppose cuts to Social Security and Medicare. Is it safe to say if you thought Hillary Clinton were doing that, you wouldn't be considering this? Well, A, I don't know that Hillary Clinton is running. B, I don't know what she is running on. Can you imagine running in the same Republican primary as Jeb Bush? If I make that decision that that's the right place for me to serve at this moment in my life, I'll run for president, and that's what my decision will be built on, but you know, I have tremendous respect for Jeb Bush. I sort of was amused about this little excerpt from, a, from your Playboy interview in 1990. The questioner asked, what is all of this meaning, talking about your yacht, the Bronze Tower, the casino, what does it really mean to you? And you replied, props for the show. And they said, what show is that? And you replied, the show is Trump, and it is sold out performances everywhere. And it has is been this, for a long time. Is this, are we all a part of a show? I mean, there is no. some, you know, you know that some of the criticisms and some of, we all feel like we're in a, are we in a reality yeah. show? No, this is not a reality. This is the real deal. One of the phrases you use, I alone can fix it. And some people, that sounded almost too strong mannish for them. Well. Uh, do you understand that criticism well, and, and what do you make of it? I'll tell you, part of it was, 
I'm comparing myself to Hillary. And we know Hillary, and we look at her record. Her record has been a disaster. And I am running against Hillary. It's not like I'm running against the rest of the world. I am going to keep focused on Donald Trump because I will be the nominee in the course of this campaign. Uh, we are going to demonstrate he has no ideas. There's no evidence he has any ideas about make, making America great, as he advertises. He seems to be particularly focused on making himself appear great. If you uh, win re-election this year, are you going to pledge to serve a full six-year term? So look, I am not running for President of the United States. I am running for the United States Senate 2018, Massachusetts, woohoo. Why is it too early to, t to announce, to, to decide? Well, you're going to have to ask my wife, who's here in the audience. You Turn told Roll Call, the Capitol newspaper, you're thinking about running for president. No, I'm not thinking about running. I absolutely I'm not going to run. You're going to run for president? Uh, I don't have made that decision. You're I, thinking I, about it? Yes. Are you running for president? I am running for president. So you don't want to become president. You won't Why run. Why do you say that? Is your goal to be the presumptive front runner? Yes. At the end of March? Yes. The president has been very clear um, that uh, he intends to run again. And if he does, I will be running with him. Does Donald Trump's 2024 plans uh, impact your 2024 plans? I have said that if President Trump runs, I will not run. What would it take to get you to run for president? Look, I'm, I am uh, going to be very focused on all of the things that we've been talking about. And, and I, I care deeply, uh, as I know you do, uh, as, as millions of people do, about this nation and, mm -hmm. and about the blessing that we have as a constitutional republic. The fact that you may run, are you sending that message without saying it? Well, <laughs> wait, I'll, I'll, I'll keep you posted on whether I'm going to run or not. But I do think we'll have better choices. When we come back, a look at the important role this show has played in covering the struggle for civil rights. I believe firmly in nonviolence. I still believe that it is the most potent weapon available to oppress people in their struggle for freedom and human dignity. Welcome back. Throughout the years, countless icons of the ever-evolving fight for civil rights and social change have appeared on Meet the Press. In 1966, the broadcast devoted a 90-minute special to the topic, bringing together the leaders of organizations including the NAACP, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, whose president was none other than Dr. Martin Luther King. And through the last 75 years, this program has featured leaders in the women's movement, Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement, and the fight for equal pay, just to name a few. Today in this special hour and a half program, Meet the Press focuses on the country's number one domestic problem, civil rights. It is very important to see the difference between nonviolent demonstrations and riots. It may be true that in a demonstration, people react with violence toward nonviolent demonstrators but you don't blame the demonstrators. This would be like blaming the robbed man because his possession of money precipitated the evil act of robbery. Ultimately, society must condemn the robber and not the robbed. It must protect the robbed. And this is where we are in these demonstrations, and I'm still convinced that there is nothing more powerful to dramatize a social evil than the tramp tramp of marching feet. As far as we're concerned, as I said before, we believe in nonviolence, providing nobody hits us. When somebody hits us, we believe in self-defense. There's a difference between self-defense and nonviolence. Well, self-defense and nonviolence are not incompatible. Dr. King, you've heard what Mr. McKissick said. Are you in disagreement or not? I believe firmly in nonviolence. I still believe that it is the most potent weapon available to oppressed people in their struggle for freedom and human dignity. I think a turn to violence on the part of the Negro at this time would be both impractical and immoral. Uh, Mrs. Roosevelt, do you think we're moving fast enough and strong enough to desegregate our schools? I do not think we want violence. I think we want understanding. I think we want education. I think we want to move, but we can't stand still. We must move, but we must move with wisdom. The code word for racism in this campaign has been the bus. It's not the bus, it's us. I think that 
the fundamental issue is not political or legal. It's, the que it's a moral question. Will white American leadership have the moral integrity and fortitude to stand by its own constitutional decisions? It's really a question of race. Uh, we are willing, if we want to allow people to kill together, to use any form of transportation, bus or ship or air. But when it comes together, when it comes to the question of our living and learning together, we still do not have enough moral strength in the White House to make essentially a moral decision to support a constitutional decision. We were kneeling. We were knocked down. They started beating us with nightsticks, tramping us with horses, and releasing the tear gas. I was hit in the head by a state trooper with a nightstick. I lost consciousness. Fifty years later, I don't recall how I made it back across that bridge to the little church that we had left from. Apparently, a group literally carried me back to the church. It would be perfectly understandable if you were bitter. Bitter today, bitter a week later uh, from when it happened, bitter 20 years. Were you bitter in, uh, ever? I was not bitter this? then. I'm not bitter now. Never before in this country, ever since the inception of the Republic, have you had a woman seriously running for the presidency. I was breaking a tradition, a tradition in which only white males have only been the gentlemen in this country that have guided the ship of state. So you don't expect people, black, white, men, or women, to suddenly overcome a tradition that has been steeped ever since the inception of this republic. So I understand that. I've broken the ice. The adversary, which is a word I prefer to enemy, are those individuals who have usurped control of our lives and who in general turn out to be that 3% of the population which is white, male, over 30, and college educated. And that is the pool from which we have taken our leadership, in fact, which I think goes a long way to explaining the poverty of the leadership. Well, are you saying that the white, male, educated uh, person is the enemy of the woman's movement, or the, the adversary? Well, uh, from a statistical point of view, that's accurate. I am absolutely comfortable with the fact that men marrying men, women marrying women, and heterosexual men and women marrying women are entitled to the same exact rights, all the civil rights, all the civil liberties. And quite frankly, I don't see much of a distinction uh, beyond that. Our team has managed to make people proud again, to capture people's interest, to make them want to do something. I think people are asking the question, how can we rally around this team? And in that really what the team stands for, whether it's equal pay or racial equality or um, LGBTQ rights. I think we've just managed to give people hope. And with that, now we need to do the next step, which is to, to um, actually take the progress step. When we come back, we've learned more sometimes on this show by talking to important figures outside the world of politics. I think the game has been here a lot longer than Allen Iverson or Michael Jordan, Grant Hill or Charles Barkley. I think what's, what sometimes is forgotten is some of the sweat and some of the, the honest work way, way long ago that's been you know, laid down for us to come here. Welcome back. Over the years, pastors and poets, astronauts and actors have joined Meet the Press to reflect on the country in changing times and to provide their own unique perspectives on our politics. I wonder if you could tell us how you feel today about appearing on this program. I feel just about the same, Mr. Clerman, as I did then. Uh, it's not easy to meet the press. This is the birth date uh, of, of Jesus the Christ, and an at-risk baby. Wise men went to the at-risk baby. Uh, the government, in effect, obligated Mary and Joseph to pay taxes. They did not have the right to vote. She had the baby outdoors in a stable in the wintertime. Wise men embrace at-risk babies and will unwise men abandon them. I challenge us to be wise. My whole goal is, as a pastor, uh, my goal is to, uh, to encourage, to support. I never take sides. I have friends who are Republicans, and I have friends who are Democrats, and I'm for my friends. Uh, people ask me, are you left wing or right wing? And it's pretty well known I say I'm for the whole bird. <laughs> Do you feel, Mr. Frost, that the um, colleges are uh, perhaps neglecting the liberal arts and favoring uh, Science and uh, no, uh, no. I far. think the the young people go where they're drawn, and there was a time when I thought science was drawing them all off from poetry. 
in, you know, my uh, jealousy. And, and then I, I've, I've heard lately that they aren't getting any scientists. I don't know where the young people have all gone. I'm going to make an inquiry. I think they've gone to sociology. You were once quoted as saying, uh, and these were your words, this could help my kids too. I want them to be better off than I was as a young man. Now, if your fondest expectations were realized and we did get to the moon, uh, what benefits do you think we may bring to future to help future generations? I think man's participation in this guarantees one thing. If we can see things, perceive them, analyze them, relate them back to our experiences here, uh, this is the main thing that man brings to the program. He can see things, new things that, that now are completely unforeseen or unknown. Dr. Sagan, do you think men should go to Mars? Well, <clears throat> depends what the objective is. If the objective is scientific exploration, and we're talking about the immediate future, I think that intelligent machines, sort of uh, descendants of Viking, are the way to go. A mission to Mars would be a, a tremendous national goal to set. Uh, it's not set yet. Uh, I personally think a uh, hundred years from now when we're talking about this, we will look back and we will have been to Mars. I am a citizen activist. I think it's in the highest tradition of our country for private citizens to speak out, uh, not just as individuals, but as members of organizations that can have some power. Uh, obviously, as someone who is famous, uh, I have a particular responsibility and I want to try to use it properly. We caught, uh, our camera caught you having a conversation with the protesters uh, last night. What did you say to them? Well, that was the funniest thing. I went over to try to talk to him. And he said I was some corporate shill, which, if you know me, that's one of the funnier things you could say about me. And then he just said, you know, you sucked as Batman. And I was like, well, you kind of you kind of got me on that one. And, and then I walked <laughs> away, and that was... Uh, that was basically it. You once wrote that a poem should be given to light and end in wisdom. Yes, the you way many, many of our poets many write things, that way? love affairs are just the same, you know. <laughs> <laughs> For generations, the moon has been an inspiration to poets and songwriters and has played an important role in romance. How do you feel about going down in history as men who helped prove that the moon is made up of nothing but dirt, dust, and rock? That's only from the short range. At a distance, it's still made up of love, kisses, and happiness. Right, it'll always be romantic. <laughs> Sports has also made a frequent appearance on the show. Whether it's in a locker room with Allen Iverson, Shaquille O'Neal, and the NBA commissioner, or on the field at Yankee Stadium with Rob Manfred in his first broadcast network interview as Major League Baseball commissioner. Over the years, we've taken an in-depth look at the problem of concussions in football. We've talked with sports figures who are pushing the pace of social change about what it's like being seen as a role model by many and why it took so long for Washington, D.C. to have its own Major League Baseball team. And we've heard from everyone from Yogi Berra to Michael Jordan to Jackie Robinson, who appeared on this show all the way back in April of 1957. Patience is fine. I think that uh, if we go back and check our record, the Negro has proven beyond a doubt that we have been more than patient in seeking our rights as, as American citizens. Uh, be patient, I was told, as a kid. Uh, I keep hearing that today. Let's be patient. Let's take our time. Things will come. It seems to me that the Civil War has been over about 93 years. If that isn't patience, I don't know what is. You and, and Muhammad Ali were, uh, were attached at the hip at those tumultuous times and, 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 and in, in many ways uh, supported each other during times when you'd be attacked by the media, you'd be attacked by political leaders. That's absolutely true. But the greatest thing about Muhammad Ali is that he represented himself as a great American because Americans will stand up for freedom, equality, and justice. You know, my father raised me uh, from a young boy to just play hard, play hard, have fun, have fun, win, 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 almost to be perfect, even though there is no you know, perfect player, perfect person, perfect game. And uh, you know, you practice how you play. If you practice certain, uh, if you practice a certain way, then you'll play a certain way. So I just try to, you know, practice hard. Athletes are secondary role models. Your parents are your primary role models. Hey, there's not many Grand Hills or Michael Jordans out there. Every kid wants to be, but they're not going to be. That's unrealistic. They have a better chance of being what their mother and father are, and that's reality. I mean, we try to 
make people think they can be famous and everything. But hey, we, these guys have special God-given abilities. They should listen to their parents and get a good education. I think the game has been here a lot longer than Allen Iverson or Michael Jordan, Grant Hill or Charles Barkley. And I think what's, what sometimes is forgotten is some of the sweat and some of the, the honest work way, way long ago that's been you know, laid down for us to come here and, and earn the type of money or get the respect of the fans or, or, of the media or whatever. And I never want to forget that. And I, and I think that's the respect that, that I ask that every athlete, every player pay back to the game. It's not to me, it's not to Charles, it's to the game of basketball. Grant Hill, what would happen to the NBA without Michael Jordan? <clears throat> well, it would give the rest of us a chance to win. <laughs> <laughs> All politics uh, is local. <laughs> should the NFL permanently be taking care of your health care? Do you think that? I think they should. You know, you told me about everything else, but you didn't tell me about the risk associated with traumatic brain injury. Do you think they knew then? Well, they had to know something. If there's one message you would like Americans to understand about Islam, what would it be? Uh, it, that it, Islam is a religion of peace. Uh, Islam does not tolerate uh, wanton murder. People have to understand that uh, there are good Muslims that are on the side of what we understand to be the rule of law and just common sense and decency. Uh, what do you tell a Trump supporter who loves watching you I, and is like, I wish you'd go to the White House? Yeah, I think that I would you know, try to share our message. Do you, you know, believe that all people are created equal? Do you believe that equal pay um, should be mandated? Do you believe that everyone should have health care? Do you believe that we should treat everyone with respect? I think those are the, the basics of what we're talking about. Cal Ripken ever think about politics? Mm. No, never. <laughs> I'm, you, uh, go, you go to the park, you see those signs, Cal for president. Oh, uh, there's, uh, there's a certain fascination with it. Um, uh, but, uh, God... It's hard enough just being a baseball player. You were a great baseball player. All-star 15 times, mm -hmm. most valuable player three times, and yet you're probably best known in America for your yogiisms. You have eight entries into Bartlett's book of quotations, oh, more than Voltaire. <laughs> let, let, let me go through a few of them on the screen and get your understanding. The first, how can you think and hit at the same time? Well, what are you, you trying to do? I don't think you can. You got too much to worry about the pitcher out there. Why can't you think it hit at the same time? Let me show you another one. You can observe a lot by watching. That's true. No, that's true. It's right. It is. You could observe a lot by watching. All right. How about this one? When you come to a fork in the road, take, take it. it. Well, we got a street back home that we have one. That's why I said take it. After I hit the home run, I, I think um, uh, I kind of got down on my knees and prayed that it was. I was glad it was over with. It was an interesting time for you because much of the country cheering you on, but some of the country saying, oh, no, no, don't have a black man vote. Break Babe Ruth's record. You still have an attic full of hate letters that you got. I certainly do, and I've been criticized for that, too, but I should... I'm going to keep them because I think that people need to be reminded that was not that far removed. You know, it was just yesterday, a, a few years ago, when that happened to me. Doesn't the nation's capital deserve a major league team again? Well, once again, uh, th that's a very nice question. It's one I choose not to answer. Uh, <laughs> the National League Committee is uh, looking hard at sites. It would be wrong to comment on sites, though I should say the passion and support of... Uh, a number of those cities is running very high. There are no plans right now to, to move a club, and we don't have any further expansion plans, but that doesn't mean that at some point uh, uh, that's a, a, it's a terrific area, but whether or not they'll get a team or when we get a team hasn't been determined. It's pitch clock coming. You know, some people said you put a clock in baseball. Why would you want to do that? <laughs> Yogi, we are out of time. I think this program is just about over. <laughs> oh, it ain't over till it's over. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? A man who can take a cue. <laughs> when we come back, even on this serious Sunday program, we still know how to laugh at ourselves and keep it all in perspective. You know, the only reason I asked that question, because I expected an answer just like that anyway. Uh, former... Uh, You're a... Oh, You're a <laughs> I assume I'm getting that as a compliment. I'll take that as a backhanded compliment. Welcome back. For obvious reasons, journalists have played a key role on Meet the Press. And there are two who have appeared more than anyone else in the 75 years. David Broder of the Washington Post holds the record with 401 total appearances. And May Craig, who was the Washington correspondent for the Portland Press-Herald, appeared 243 times. 
Before we go, it's been a lot of fun on this show for years, and we wanted to show you a few of those fun moments. I don't want to be president. I want to run for president. There's a difference. I'm running in South Carolina. You'd like to lose? Mm, I'd like to lose twice. I'd like to lose a, both a Republican and a Democrat. And what statement would that make? I think that statement would make that I was able to get on the ballot in South Carolina. And if I can do it, so can you. Seth Myers, welcome to Meet the Press. It's great to be here. I'm so excited to be on Meet the Press without having to run for office. <laughs> right. So much easier this but way. But if you do want to declare something, you know, feel free to do that. I might. I think mostly I'm just going to run from previous statements <laughs> and uh, hit some talking points. <laughs> I'm watching a lot of Meet the Press to prepare for this. <laughs> Give me your percentage prediction. Kerry Bush Nader. Uh, I think that uh, Kerry's going to get 52 percent. Democrats 50, in, um, in Bush 52, what? Uh, 47. And one for Nader. One for Nader. 52, 47, right. one. All right. <laughs> Mr. Carr. Well, Mr. Russell, everybody knows that I have dyslexia. And what I really meant to say, I just transposed the numbers wrong, <laughs> you know? That's all I want. Oh, I see. You know what I say? <laughs> I got an egg on my oh face. My <laughs> I don't believe this. I got an egg on my oh. face. It was a bad prediction. Should I be relieved you didn't bring your shotgun in today? Uh, I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> You're not in season. <laughs> Mr. Vice President, I hope I never am. Before you go, Mr. Secretary, last time you were on one month ago, I received thousands of letters and telegrams about this scene. Let's just watch it Tim, for a second. Tim, don't swing the camera away from me again. <laughs> Finally, Mr. Secretary, in February 2003, you placed your enormous personal credibility before the United Nations and laid out a case against Saddam Hussein, uh -huh. c citing... No, they can't use it. They're editing it. It's, they He's still asking stop. me questions. Yeah. He was not Tim, I'm sorry. I lost you. You answered the question. And because of that, we were eternally grateful. We'd like to present you the first annual Colin Powell Palm Tree Award for answering questions under adverse circumstances. <laughs> You'll forever be in the annals of Meet the Press. We thank you again for joining us today. Well, well Tim, thank you very much. Uh, I honor this. Did you ever run for office again? I'd rather set myself on fire than to run for office again. You know, the only reason I asked that question, because I expected an answer just like that. Anyway, uh, former... Uh, You're a Oh, <laughs> I assume I'm getting that as a compliment. I'll take that as a backhanded compliment. I hate the press. I hate you, especially. <laughs> but the fact is, I, we need you. We need a free press. To dig into more moments from Meet the Press and our archives, scan the code right here on your screen or visit NBCNews.com slash MTP75. The website is home to 75 of the biggest moments in Meet the Press history. Check them out. See if you agree with our picks. That's all for today. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Thanks for watching. We'll be back next week and next year. Because if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press.